Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming here. It's an honor to have you around, especially with this beautiful weather. Uh, I was looking at the lake, so I thought some of our people went over there. Um, today is a um, kind of special presentation. Um, last year, around this time, June, I gave a similar presentation to, to this. And we received a lot of feedback, and most of the feedback was uh, you you talked about geopolitical things. Uh, could you please talk more about that next time? And uh, the feedback that I've been getting in the last 12 months is people want to know more about those geopolitical trends and how those geopolitical forces are affecting macroeconomic decisions, policy making. So. This presentation today is going to be probably slightly different from what you normally see in the financial industry. Normally, as a macroeconomist, I focus 80% on macroeconomic stuff. This time, I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to bring in a lot of the geopolitical uh, things that we are monitoring. But nothing here is art f just for, for a large. We m monitor and going to present here geopolitical stuff that unfortunately has an impact on markets and will have an impact on markets in years to come. OK, um, let's start. Um, I'm going to talk about, first, a little introduction, global macroeconomic trends, geopolitical trends. A special focus on the Middle East. What I will show you there regarding the Middle East, probably most of you will have not seen beef before. Um, there is something going on in the Middle East that I think very few people here are aware of. Uh, uh, strategies, a uh, fixed income strategy called me yesterday in the evening asking me about uh, Iraq, for instance, what is happening in, in, in Iraq. and. Um, this, what you're seeing now in Iraq, is just part of what we're going to talk about today in the Middle East. There is other factors, apart from macro and pure geopolitical, that are joining this global convergence process. And um, we will talk about those factors. Um, yeah, there's some suggestions at the end. I also want to start saying something which I think we should remember. Since we're going to talk today about geopolitical things, I was wondering, this is not regular that you hear about geopolitical things in the investment world or the, the financial world. So I wanted to take the opportunity to, to remind you that 70 years ago, around in the month of June, quite a few things were happening. We had the landing in Normandy. And people say, oh, yes, they're very nice, uh, victory in Europe. But you know, the landing in Normandy was necessary because this continent, this continent failed to do something when the beginnings were visible. We became war weary, war tired, and we actually closed an eye on aggression. And this is my introduction today, because something very similar is happening today. The West is war-weary, and powers are emerging. They see how weary and tired we are. They say, oh, the Europeans, the Americans, they just want peace, and we're not looking after things. The mere fact that we are not being clear, and that we are tolerant, with that we're tolerating a lot of the aggressive foreign policy in emerging markets is something that is shaping now the global geopolitical agenda. Yeah, let's start with that. This is the introduction. 70 years ago, almost to the day, some 15,000 paratroopers landed behind the German lines. and. Uh, I wrote exact numbers because we often hear, yeah, some 20,000 did it, and yeah, they have some casualties. But you know, I don't know how many of you have been to a commemoration or anniversary of uh, World War II when it ended. Not in our generation, I think. And it's good to, to see every single number there. Because what we're going to see in Europe and Middle East and Asia the next five to seven years, five to seven years, will affect a lot of people. And I believe 
many, many soldiers will have to go to fight because we did not arrest the beginnings today. The world is very tolerant in the face of aggression. We have seen that recently in Ukraine. And that will all come at a price later. And um, many people among you know attrition ratio among paratroopers. Who, who, who probably has a guess among paratroopers, attrition ratio? The possibility of you being wounded or killed. Yeah, very high. On that campaign, 48%. And they came to liberate Europe, and I believe Europe is now exactly as war-weary as it was before World War II. Passivity. Passivity is something that I would say is the common denominator in the West. Yeah. From politics to military, from religion and to science, the status quo and the stability of the system is being challenged at the moment. So it is not just people in the financial industry, they're going crazy. Um, I take time to meet politicians, diplomats, scientists, even people from the religious field, and they are telling me that in their own fields, people are as crazy, as stressed and panicky as we are in the financial industry. It is not just happening. Things are being challenged there. Things are being challenged. So it is not just in the financial industry that we're seeing this. I would like to say this. What you see in the financial industry the last 10, 15 years is merely reflecting that which is happening in society as a whole. It's what we are seeing in our industry is just reflecting to a large extent, I was reflecting what is happening in the world. And we're going to see, actually, uh, I cannot focus on too many things. I'm not going to focus too much on science. I'll focus on a few areas that are very important for, for the Middle East. We don't have just enough time for, 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 for more. But just a few. Democracies, as, as we know, are becoming very polarized, more uh, difficult to be governed. The new democracies are struggling. We see that. Man, you, you thought Argentina was a democracy? You thought that Bolivia was a democracy? Uh, well, or Thailand? We see also the United States' access to disease is being challenged. We don't talk, we don't hear anything about that in the news. The United States no longer has full access to all the sea routes. They are vital for world commerce. Turkey now is enter a big deal with Russia, a security deal with Iran but officially is a NATO member. It is not the first time that Turkey is doing that. Turkey is so strong and powerful, nobody in NATO or the West dares to tell Turkey, don't do that. And it's not the only country, just a small example of a country that is rising, that says, I can do whatever I want, I go after it. And they're going after their right, you know, national interests. China, Brazil, Turkey, just to mention a few countries, are supplying Iran for years now, for more than 10 years. They supply Iran with all Iran needs. Officially, Iran is under a UN embargo. No Western nation dares to tell Brazil or Turkey or China, what are you doing there? This is a UN embargo. I want you to start seeing what is very obvious on the political scene. The new rise in powers are not being checked by anybody. They are rising unchecked, and they are becoming more aggressive. More and more aggressive. Another area, science. We all talk about global warming for more than 10, 15 years. More and more scientists are opposing global warming and saying we have global climate change, not necessarily warming. And they're actually saying, many analysts uh, and scientists are saying, well, all this climate change could also be uh, a result of Earth gravitation and magnetic field changes, only partly human. Uh, and this is a huge battle now happening in science realm. Go to the next realm, religion. Many of you probably in our industry are not exposed to that topic. But there is a dramatic movement in the world called the charismatic movement that is challenging 
all established religions, Catholicism, Protestantism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, are all being challenged by this Christian charismatic movement. It's an earthquake there. They are all in panic and a state of maybe kind of crisis, you would say. Um, something is changing here. So there are elements in the world that are, that are changing that are going to affect uh, politics and financial markets very soon. Some of the slides, I will just pass them on because I have them only uh, in case some of you have questions and feel free to ask me. Uh, I have some slides in between that are more explanatory, but I will just jump them in case nobody has a question because some slides are just for information in there. So I will be, I will be jumping some, some slides if I see no faces tilting or people asking questions. Here are the global macroeconomic trends. The rise of emerging markets, we know that. Something's happening, it's being slowed down. There is a liquidity squeeze going on the last eight, nine months in the emerging world. And that is why many of these emerging powers are now looking for trouble overseas or beyond their borders. I would say this, many emerging powers are now deflecting. They have a lot of domestic pressure. They have a liquidity squeeze for eight, nine months now that is very serious. And when you are is feeling pressure and problems at home domestically as a government, you may want to deflect. Well, we have a problem anyway with some of our neighbors or some other country, you do that. You see Russia doing that with Ukraine, you see Turkey doing that with the Middle East and Syria, you see that all over the place now. China is also facing a, a liquidity squeeze. You see China becoming very active with these conflicts with the neighbors. I, I, I would have a, okay, it's a very good question. I, I was uh, wanting to, to skip that slide, but I will show you the slide where we can show the liquidity squeeze in emerging markets. Um, but since we're here, why not? I will, I will not skip it here. This is aggregate, this is database, it's proprietary. It, I aggregate here the broad monetary supply of all the leading, the eight leading emerging markets, and this is the growth year over year. You don't see this normally around because unfortunately most houses, most uh, banks don't care aggregating. But look at the amazing growth that we've been having in money supply in these countries, 30% when they were doing well, 30%. And look at this, this is what I call the squeeze. Look at this. We come from 30%, 36% to what? 2%. Liquidity, these emerging markets need a lot of liquidity and liquidity growth to keep going. And when they are doing well, their liquidity is growing at at least 25% per annum. And what we see now is a dramatic squeeze over these years. And they have had to cut liquidity because their currencies have been under pressure. So it's not that they want to do that. It's the last thing they want to do, put an end to their political ca careers and bring recession to their home countries. But when their whole system is unstable, they have to start you know, removing excess liquidity. This is the problem for emerging markets. I would say, uh, yes. Yeah, this is a very good question. You still would see, you still would see, China has an impact here, but you would still see the dramatic slowdown in liquidity growth in emerging markets ex-China. It's dramatic. It's just big. The reason why we don't see it is because almost nobody is aggregating all leading emerging markets. You look at China alone, Russia alone, India alone, and you look at in local currency. Um, but there is a quite serious squeeze in liquidity, and that uh, I meet a lot of investors that are not aware of the seriousness, the severity of the liquidity squeeze in these emerging markets. And therefore, when I tell them, watch out for geopolitical problems, they don't take it seriously. 
I spent a lot of time on the road in spring last year telling people, watch out, a lot of stuff is going to come in emerging markets, there is a liquidity squeeze coming. They told me, I don't know liquidity squeeze. Let's keep on watching. Intra-Asian trade is almost dead. Intra-Asian trade, although the economies are recovering, is almost dead. Very interesting and a concern. And one reason for that is geopolitical tensions. Geopolitical tensions in Asia are rising beyond what we've seen in the last 20 years. They're very bad. And I believe they're beginning to affect intra-Asian trade. Middle East is eyeing a revival. Why? Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey are getting closer together, integrated economically. So there is a lot of hope for Middle East. Um, I want to talk more about that. Fragility, I don't want to talk much about that because I think we have a lot of experts talking recently about that. You see something in blue, nationalism, military buildup. This is very important. They're leading to lower long-term growth. Military buildup is very good for factory output, short term. It's very good. It creates also very good monetary stock. It's good for government income. But the more aggressive you become with your military buildup, the less trust with your neighbors. That reduced trust has an impact on long-term growth. Demographics, many people, many people know about that already. I think I will not talk much about it. Income inequality, I mentioned it there, but I will not focus on it today. Social transformation is something that few economists and bankers care about. And this is why I put it in blue. Social transformation is big. It's one of those big changes in the world in this decade. And I think we are not aware of that enough. We need to do a bit more work on that in the political polarization. All over the world, when you look at the elections, are now 48 to 52%. Somebody wins, is 51% to 49%. Left and right, really, left and right, quite divided. Many countries now, not just in emerging markets or the US, are becoming heavily polarized. We have that, we have a center of Christianity shifting also to Asia and the South. It's a huge change here taking place. Um, resources constrained, a lot of people know that. They're, they're re-emerge in the United States. The rise of Sub-Saharan Africa, very important. This is why I put it in blue. And this is why we have a big interest now in the superpowers in Africa. These things are converging. And it would be good enough if only these things were converging. But we're going to go now into the, uh, the geopolitical side later. Yes, you have a, quite a question. I will go into that because this is one of the big shifts that is affecting Middle East policy. And uh, yeah, I will, I will do. But I can say already the, um, it's one of the big things that is affecting the Middle East. There is, on the one hand, the intra-Islamic war, conflict. We're not aware of that. It's very severe. We see that only in Syria, but it's happening everywhere. Repression is horrible within countries. Uh, yeah, they, what they are doing to one another is, is very bad. We just don't see it here. It's very, very bad. Um, uh, basically, it's happening not just in Syria. Syria is the only place because we're watching it. And on the other hand, but I can say a little bit about that as it's your interest, you see a lot of people in the Middle East who are tired of this fight, tribal wars, and they are now, with the internet, they're watching on the internet uh, church in the West. Millions of people in the Middle East are becoming Christians. It's a big crisis for the Ayatollahs and the religious leaders in that part of the world. They are alarmed by that, and they're, they're doing something about it. Um, so, Islam feels challenged. Uh, we talked about that already. This is also from our aggregated um, uh, database that we use. These are the G7 aggregated. You see GDP, money supply, and industrial production. And as a macroeconomist, I have to touch base on this because this is, this is like a, a foundation for the presentation. G7, 38% of world output. E8, I call E8 the eight leading emerging markets. 
34%. You see they're almost equally heavy. You see here the liquidity squeeze and slowly nominal GDP coming off. Something interesting though, military buildup is strong, very strong in the West and in emerging markets. Military industry is one of the few industries that has helped the world economy avoid a major recession. It is a gigantic industry at the moment, and you see that here, that uptick here. You see that also in the West. When I look at the official numbers spending on defense and military, I smile. Uh, I smile that nobody asks questions about that. Um, but look at that, the G7 are recovering, and something very interesting, very interesting, you can see the liquidity line, I think it's green, right? I'm, I'm a bit colorblind, it's green. Here, people said it's going to collapse because of tapering. And I was telling people, it would probably not. G7 economies are recovering, and real economy can generate or induce its own money supply. It works, even in China. So even if the Fed is tapering, I've been telling last year, even if the Fed was tapering, expect money supply in the G7 to grow this year. And as you see, it's growing very nicely. G7 recovery looks OK. This here doesn't look good. Positive signs of stabilization in industrial production, but after this collapsing liquidity, you can expect more decline and weakness in GDP. For those of you who have done uh, data analysis or econometrics, this might be interesting for you. We look at the G78, but also Z-score. We, we do a Z-score of, of the GDP growth rate. And you can see that the G7 is almost around zero. So the growth momentum or the thrust of growth in the G7 is just above zero. There is no cyclical pressure yet for inflation. Look here at the E8, the emerging markets, minus one standard deviation. This is deflationary. Emerging markets, led by China, are exporting deflation to us. And here, let's see how it develops. Uh, but when you look at this Z-score, it tells you why bond yields are low at the moment. Yes, please. Yes. This is a very interesting question that, you, that you're posing. We have to differentiate. I mean, the headlines industry focuses on headline numbers. Brazil, India have a very high structural inflation. It has nothing to do with the, with the business cycle. Brazil, even if you have money supply growth of zero over two years, you will still have inflation. The reason is geography and bottlenecks, infrastructural bottlenecks that have nothing to do with the business cycle. Uh, so you have to differentiate. If you are a macroeconomist, you have to make a differentiation between. You have to divide that, and you have to analyze them separately. And this is why I express here very clearly: cyclical deflationary pressure in emerging markets. The infrastructure, the infrastructure or structural inflation is there, but that's not one that you can fight or you can do anything about it. That takes years to be removed. You need to improve the infrastructure. Yeah. But it's a very good question. Uh, I think a lot of people make no differentiation between structural and cyclical. And now to your question about the liquidity shock. Here again, we do Z-score analysis of the liquidity shocks. And you can see this is something that we ran in February 2014, the 5th of February. Please have a look at that. The liquidity shock in emerging markets. China, only one standard deviation was actually OK. But look at Russia, almost three standard deviations shock. So you could actually say for the financial system of Russia, what happened in the last year has been severe, really severe. Um, so if you ask me, January er, this year, some trouble in the Ukraine, uh, what we told our, our fund managers is, watch out, Russia is going to overreact to, to that. 
the West is meddling in Ukraine. Very clear message. When we saw this 5th of May, we said Russia is going to react aggressively to that meddling of the West in Ukraine because of this massive liquidity shock. I'll be very frank with you. If you invest in these markets, you have to watch the liquidity and the politics. Yes, please. It is, uh, I respect your version. I have people working, we have colleagues working in Russia that were already calling us and telling us to sell everything in Russia before the Ukraine crisis be began. But I respect your opinion, uh, sure. Russia, since last year, changed the way they operate in the local market. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think we can discuss it later on. Um, I think we can more or less move on. This, these slides were, made, were there just to help us uh, maneuver, but I think we can move on. I will not touch on this. This is all known. This is you know, in income inequality. You know this. Um, I will go now to um, um, this is something that you all know. Yeah, I will go to the geopolitical trends. There is a massive military buildup in emerging nations. There is reduced maritime and energy security. Even the United States doesn't have full access to the maritime rules like it used to. Some countries are blocking the United States there. We have a lot of unresolved conflicts in Asia flaring up. In blue, nationalism and anti-Semitism is big and coming back all over the world, even in Europe very very strong and um, we've seen this before uh, when both of them rise together it's a sign of something is going to happen then um, radicalization of Islam is how many people see it here for people in the uh, Middle East it's a very beautiful thing that is happening is the rise of Islam so I write both because it depends on which side you are for for Saudi Arabia and Egypt is a radicalization for the people who are embracing Islam is a great thing, it's a rise. Rise of Turkey, I think it's very important. The most important event in this decade is the rise of Turkey. Um, then the declustering. This is happening right now, and this is one reason why world growth is a bit weak. The global supply chain has been heavily exposed to Northeast Asia. This is being declustered now. There is a NATO encirclement of Russia. We're not going to go too much into that. There is a revolutionary socialism in Latin America. This is important because it's affecting policy in the United States. And very clearly, policy is veering left there. In the next 18 months, China is achieving nuclear first strike capability. This sounds funny, but I really mean it. The end of STAR, the new START treaty in Europe. And this has implications for Europe. And here, finally, the superpowers, China, the US are converging more and more. Uh, all superpowers are now increasing the tight control over their people, information, surveillance, etc. So there are many ways in which you will not tell any difference between China and the United States. It's all converging. Yes. Give us an example of nine. Number nine. Number nine. Maybe yeah. Example. Price of Revolution Association in Latin America. Yeah. This is a, I think, very few people care about that in, in Europe. And this is very sad. I always hear that there is a capitalism, market economy is back in Latin America. It couldn't be more away from the truth. The reality is there are only four nations in Latin America, the, all of Latin America, four nations, they are still completely committed to market economy. All the others almost all the others have committed to revolutionary socialism one way or the other. Led by Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina, the three nations.
Brazil, they're in early stages and Venezuela is bankrupt. So it's, uh, You're looking at the economy? Ideologically, those three nations you just mentioned lead, shape the ideological heartbeat of Latin America. If you are a writer or politician in those countries and you are not Leninist or Marxist or Maoist, you're nobody. You're nobody. But if you are Marxist, Leninist, and you are a writer or a politician, you've got a great future before you. And look, it's different from us. You know, we don't, we don't um, I think we, we have to understand Latin America is a bit different. In Latin America, if you are a socialist or revolutionary socialist, uh, you don't walk around with a Kalashnikov. You are just, you are, I would say, a, a, someone that is friendly to the third way, the Latin American way. But it's not market economy. I just, yeah. Sorry, just to continue. But populism is, is what like, has been there for, for many decades or centuries. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's one thing is to be a populist with cash and the other one without. And now <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that, that's a different thing. Yeah. Just a quick one. But within South, uh, I mean, more, mostly South America, there is there has been maybe ten years in the making a divide between between left. There was the extreme left and the pragmatism. And yeah. It's clear at the beginning that the extremists were, you know, guided by Venezuela. And then at some point when when Lula comes, with Brazil you have to start the pragmatists. And actually the pragmatists, which are perceived as part of friendly slowly winning because even in cases like Bolivia they are sympathetic to Venezuela but what they are doing in the yeah, country, yeah. they are doing closer to what the Brazil or Chile or Peru yeah. do yeah. Venezuela. It sounds very good the way you say it, but you don't convince me. I have a very different opinion, but I respect your, your opinion uh, that uh, it's all very uh, friendly to market economy. Uh, look, uh, Half my family lives and works in Brazil, so I, I tend to have a slightly different view. Uh, uh, I don't know any wealthy person in Brazil that is leaving his money in Brazil. I don't know anybody. None do my friends, none do my relatives. Nobody that I know, have con know of is leaving his money in Brazil. No one that I know of, um, Argentina is one of my favorite countries in Latin America, is keeping his money in, Lat in Argentina. But how about Brazil? I think we have a very nice, I mean, I, I think we like to think the trouble is only in Asia and Middle East. I would caution with that. I would not say that Latin America is, is a sinkhole, but I would say Latin America is going in the wrong route. And it looks good now. As long as the income from gas and oil is there, it's going to be okay. I have, an, I have a nephew in Brazil who told me I'm leaving Brazil because all of my friends at school, who finished school, they're all living from some government money. And that's how they grew up. That's how I grew up. And he's 18 years old. He's telling me that. I mean, it sounds good for you, but when the money from oil uh, income runs out, how are you going to pay the bill? Uh, yeah, I, I, have, I disagree with that, but I appreciate the, the comment. I think we have to move on. This is, to me, the more important chart, and probably the most important chart I can show you today. Uh, I've been working on this for a few years. Uh, it, I borrowed it from the CIA, and I updated it. And you can see here how Russia and China are moving south. Russia and China are expanding and becoming very, very active, maybe aggressive in these areas where you see. And there are bottlenecks for the maritime trade. You see them here in blue, these bottlenecks. And um, the situation is not good. There's more and more tensions on here. More and more governments have to send warships here to patrol this area. And um, something very interesting, very interesting, you're seeing the United States Fifth Fleet now preparing to move to, to this area here. There is a long port, probably 80 kilometers long, being built right now here to, uh, to allow the whole fifth fleet of the United States to move to a safe place. Things are preparing in the Middle East and in this part of the world for some kind of confrontation. They are at the moment, most of them are stationed at different places of the Gulf states and inside the Strait of Ormuz. Yeah. 
but they have now uh, uh, an Alamo a pullback position here, out of their range of uh, short, and ro short range rockets. Something very interesting has happened with all this pressure in the Middle East in those routes. Uh, Russia has seen its hour. It's actually already preparing this route for the next few years. Climate change is helping Russia. And a lot of Asian nations, China, Japan, and Korea, are very keen to support Russia with this new route. I mean, they all know how difficult the situation is getting here in the South China Sea and also here in the Middle East. Uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries of t this trouble in the Middle East is Russia. Yeah. Could you, could you briefly remind us how, how many months during the year the northern route is open? Like six, seven months? It used to be like that. Very good. Very, very good guess. It's changing very rapidly now. And uh, Russia is building uh, massive nuclear powered uh, icebreakers to help during those two remaining months where it's still blocked. So you could actually now already open the route in the winter with the help of super icebreakers. Yeah, that's interesting, it's happening and uh, China, Korea, Japan are throwing money at that because for them it's a lifeline. The, the, even if they don't believe in anything happening in the Middle East, the Asians are very worried about the South, East, South China Sea, so they want to have an alternative route. I, again, the biggest beneficiary of that is Russia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't have to foresee it. They're already working together. And uh, we in the West have something to do with, with, with that. Uh, for a long time, Russia has been uh, uh, cooperating with us. But I can tell you, in diplomatic circles, it's a giving. The, the, the Russians are fed up with the West. They're working together with the Chinese. And actually, it's a perfect match. They've never trusted each other, but it's a perfect match. The Chinese have what the Russians don't have, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good point as well. South China Sea, I won't say much, but it's not looking good. And that's why China, Japan and Korea are desperate to help Russia with, um, with the Arctic route. These are official numbers of military spending. I, I suggest to you to enjoy them with a lot of caution. Just surveillance spending in China equals 55% of what they say they spend on military alone. So it's very interesting to look at those numbers, but I understand nobody has an interest to, to expose that industry. It's probably the, the only strong industry in the world the last 10 years. Here are some of the conflicts in Asia that are resurging. Please have a look at them. It's only half of them that I put. These conflicts are coming up at the moment. In the past, many of those countries were poor. Now they have money and weapons, and they got a, bit, they got a few things open. As we say in German, often the Rechnungen that you want to take care of. And here, military jobs is a big, big support for the economy. This is now the newest situation. East Asia. China is achieving nuclear first strike capability in the next few months. To be able to respond using a submarines nuclearly, China has to have access to the Pacific. Otherwise, they will explode over their own heads. They have to go through the Okinawa Islands of Japan. Japan has sealed the corridor with missiles. It's done already. So China has now to go through the north to Soviet Union, a very long route. And um, but is the only thing that China can do. China and Russia are almost being forced to cooperate now. That's the situation. Okay, I will now go to this. Middle East, this is the, basically the end of it, this is the last part. I have to 
but I'm ha happy there have been some questions because it's very good to talk. Uh, so I prefer to skip some slides and you ask questions. Um, we talk in the West a lot about the Shia-Sunni conflict. One thing that you, I hope you can take from here is that that doesn't exist anymore. That is for the press and for politics. Shia-Sunni conflict stopped long ago. What we have now is a confrontation between secular Muslims, moderate Muslims, and mo uh, Muslims who want to be true Muslims that have embraced Islam, which others call fundamentalist Islam. And you have actually uh, in the press the talk about Shia versus Sunni. It's not the case. Really not. In some countries it is, but as a, as a whole it is not. And what we see is that the fundamentalism, is Islamic fundamentalism is winning, winning big time. In the local populations of the Middle East, Islamic fundamentalism, Islam, is making big waves. They have 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the population in almost all those countries now. So the time is running out for those uh, secular Sunni rulers or secular Sunni states. Something else we're having now is a northern alliance and a southern alliance being built in the Middle East. Look at the northern alliance. It's led by Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Syria. You saw recently the United States is embracing Iran. Well, that has got to do with Turkey. The southern alliance is led by Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And Iran has called for one million men as martyrs to bring war to Israel and Sunni. They did it before they met here, uh, came to Geneva for the first peace talks. It's interesting. Our, uh, I didn't see that the entity said, I didn't see it in the media. Nobody really reported about that. But Iran is preparing for a war. Uh, it seems that nobody here wants to report on that. Um, and I will show you why we think that the Iranians are serious about that. Israel preparing for a major attack within the next 18 months. Why? And uh, this is one thing I want to show you. This is the growth of this charismatic movement in the world, which is shaking Catholicism, Protestantism, Hinduism. Many religions are being shaken by that because the growth of this charismatic movement is tremendous, even in, especially in Africa and Asia, growing at more than 4.8% per annum, in some places 7%. And uh, that's also putting Islamic leaders under pressure. Now look at this. This is where, according to the CIA and the Pentagon, Islam, uh, former Muslim states have become more fundamentalist, more, uh, more fervent in their Islamic faith, with an R. This is Islamic world. Almost every second country, especially the geopolitical key countries, have an R. They are now really, on f the population, fervently behind Islam. And look at the alliances now being built. Here, the Southern Alliance, led by Saudi Arabia and Egypt, used to have the support of the United States. The United States, has, Obama has dropped that support and has offered to support Iran, embrace, do a, a peace deal with Iran. And look who is on the Iranian side, all these countries, even Kazakhstan. These two blocks are building. Why does the West need Iran? Because of the problem with Russia. The Europe is depending on Russian gas at the moment. But Iran has a lot of gas too. Huge amount of gas. Iraq has a little bit, but we need Iran. And you see, I've drawn already here the, pipes, the pipelines that, will be, that are being prepared to be built. Once the deal is signed with the United States, the peace deal, a pipeline will be built that will connect Iran, northern Iraq, through Turkey, up to Romania, and from there into the rest of Europe. Iranian gas is going to power Europe in the next few years. And that's the reason, one of the main reasons why the West, especially the United States, is dropping these countries here, the moderate, the U US is dropping the moderate Muslim states, to support Iran. Not because we like it, uh, we, we also see the, you know, uh, that Europe needs gas. Yes, you have a question. Well, I don't, well, I wouldn't qualify Saudi Arabia as moderate, as I've been funding all kind of... Uh, Absolutely. Extreme uh, Muslim 
Muslim movements, uh, not least in Egypt. This definition is purely geopolitical, but I agree with you completely. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I agree with you completely. That's not perfect. It's purely geopolitical. In geopolitical military terms, Saudi Arabia is an ally of the West, still fights, they still try to fight uh, terrorism, etc. But I agree with you, there are foundations, they fund everything. Uh, yeah. I don't want to touch those things in detail, but I want to go straight to why um, I've been telling you that the next 18 months could see a war break up. Um, it, with this, I will finish. You see here. We're trying always to understand what's going on in the Middle East with our Western thinking. Our Western thinking is Greek-Roman influenced. We think linear, rational, and progressive. That's Western thinking. That doesn't work like that in the Middle East. They don't think like that. They think slightly different. And the religious leaders, the religious leaders in the Middle East, for them, religion honoring history plays a very important role whether Israel or Arab states, they care a lot about this. And one thing that we, I think we always overlook when we do analysis of their, this region is we forget that they care a lot about their religion, they care a lot about their prophets, they care a lot about their religious uh, you know, uh, beliefs. And this is where, um, this is actually an inter inter interesting slide. Uh, we have four lunar eclipses, and this is all from NASA. We have four lunar eclipses, total lunar eclipses, um, happening in the world this and next year. You see the dates. And right in the middle, we have a total solar eclipse. That doesn't mean anything to us because we are in the West. But two-thirds of the world follows a lunar kind of calendar. And Jews and Muslims, many of them care about this. Why? Because this time, every one of these total lunar eclipses is falling on a major Jewish holy day. Doesn't say anything to us, but you know what? In the past, when such a rare event has happened, the enemies of Israel, let's say the Arab states, have tried to annihilate Israel. You know why? For the Jews, that's a sign of judgment of God against them. They're worried about that, they're concerned. And the enemies of Israel have known this for over a thousand years. So they, they see in those, in those times a great chance to eliminate Israel. And this is actually the last tetrad, as we call it in astronomy, that we're gonna see the next 200 years following on these Jewish holy days. So the religious leaders in Israel are very worried. They are very worried. This is the last best chance for the religious leaders in the Middle East who want to wipe out Israel to do so. The last chance, the last best chance, I would say, the next 200 years, probably. Uh, this is what keeps, uh, what is making the, the, the Jews very careful because it also times very well with Iran uh, achieving its nuclear weapons and the war that is going on in, uh, now in the Middle East. At the moment, she, it looks like Shia and Sunni are fighting each other. But I tell you, that fight is going to be finished soon because they need to join together to, to face Israel. And who can join Shia and Sunni? Turkey can. Turkey will. And the United States is already preparing for that. Now, another thing is, in the year 2017, we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the capture of Jerusalem by the Turks. And Turkish leaders are already offering Arab states, if you follow our lead, we can guarantee to you, we can have back Jerusalem again 2017. There is a few important things, anniversaries taking place in 2017, and what we hear, what we are hearing, is that religious leaders in the Middle East they want to they want to make sure those anniversaries don't take place because it is a great chance for them, and uh, they really feel also that time is on their on their side. Just for your information, those tetras that I mentioned, the last few that happened, 1968, Arab nations attack or there was a war between Israel and Arab nations, the Six-Day War. 
1948, the Arab states invaded the rebirth Israel. It failed. And in 1940, uh, 1492, Spain, in those days a superpower, decided to finish Israel too. They expelled the Jews and persecuted them. So, as you can see, the Jews, the Jews have very good reasons, historical reasons, why they are concerned about this tetra that we're in now. They're very concerned. In the past, the enemies of Israel have tried to do something, and they expect it to happen again. So, this is it. Um, I, we have already a few interventions and questions, but if anybody has a question, please. Very clearly, uh, Chile, Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. And they, have, they are under tremendous pressure by the other states, by the way. Some of them are even speaking of doing a war against those countries because they are betraying the Latin spirit of uh, revolutionary socialism. And we're not talking about jokes. It's really at state level. They're talking about uh, uh, doing, I mean, starting a conflict with them. But I have to say, you should not think that Peru and Chile, Colombia, those countries are, you know, capitalism is inscribed in stone. In Chile, mass protests in the last two years are pro-socialism. They're huge. The government has had to fire the cabinet twice already in the last 16 months and change the cabinet members, all of them except for two, with socialist politicians. Chile is also under pressure to veer to the left. So I want to say Chile looks very good on the outside, but this, the socialism in Latin America is very, very strong. It may look, I would say, very pragmatic at the moment, but it is very strong. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, you know, one reason why I would not uh, be totally concerned about that is the fact that the United States keeps Okinawa, you know, um, this island here. Um, no, I, I'll show it to you in another one. Uh, Okinawa is very key. Um, okay, here. This star, yellow, that's Okinawa, actually where my grandparents come from. From here, you dominate the whole Sea of Japan, South China Sea. The United States 7th Fleet is here and here. That's the reason why uh, we have peace at the moment in that part of the world. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. China, China's uh, power is growing almost by the month. And now they're working together with Russia. This is making the whole thing very complex now. For your information, very large ships are already, already, not longer traveling here. They're already taking the huge, long detour to go this way to make sure they make it. Because we don't know when hostilities will break out. Big ships are already going a long detour here in the mid-open ocean. A lot of Navy ships at the moment in the Pacific. A lot of Navy ships. Um, and I, I, I believe if we in the West would stand for our values and morals and would speak out when something is not right, I think a lot of these things would not be happening. But for the last 15 years, with the rise of these emerging markets, we have pampered them, we have done everything to get business deals, and we have never said or said something when we should have said it. For 15 years, they have gone unchecked, all of these countries. And uh, I think that we are going to probably harvest what we have sown. For business deals, we have actually uh, not said anything or, or done very little. So we have actually unchecked nationalism rampant all over the world now, unchecked. Western geopolitical activity in the 
those countries. And now that they are finally seen an economic rise, they have a, what many of them consider a rightful yes. power to challenge the West because yeah. the West has been misdoing a lot of things in the region. You're right about that. You're completely right about that. Uh, to what extent what you mentioned is applicable, to what extent the West now can do something. Maybe you're right. This is what many politicians say. They say there is not much we can do. The only thing we can do is crisis management. I mean, uh, many politicians are saying this. Military officers, intelligence, they are sharing this information. Um, there was another question here. Sorry. Just back to your slide for the future party plans and the Middle East to and the rest of Europe. Yeah. There are other pipes, actually. There are other pipes being built. There is another one here. Um, there actually, it's not just that one with Libya. There is another one being built here. Uh, here, right this way. Here. But, but. Exactly. We have now the problem. All these other pipes can be blocked by somebody. All of them can be blocked by somebody and have geopolitical risks. The safest one. The biggest gas fields in the West, apart from Russia, or this part of the world, are here. The biggest. Second biggest are here, right here, northern part of Iraq. That's why it makes sense to do it here, to get these two largest gas fields over land and over Turkish, which is not, Turkish NATO territory. So that is what makes sense. And you know, I've said a few things against some countries today. I don't mean anything against nobody. I'm just purely speaking from an analytical point of view. Purely analytical. Nothing for against US, Israel, or Arab countries. I, I, uh, if I cannot be harsh in my analytical thinking, I cannot do this. Uh, but what the US is doing, dropping Egypt, Saudi Arabia, in order to provide gas for Europe, why is this happening? Because we in Europe didn't take care of it. We did not do to, to, to our own homework. And by doing that, the United States is dropping also the peace for Israel. Yeah, yeah. Which is not an excuse for you know World War Two. Huh? Uh, yes. Europe. We have seen how dependent Europe is. Europe is basically completely unable to do anything, even if attacked, uh, because we depend so much on Russian gas. We depend tremendously on Russian gas. In the United States, even in, even in Congress, people were shocked to see how little Europe can do in case of emergency. The Americans realize, unless they provide for another gas resource for Europe, Europe is not a partner. They're on their own. They are on their own. Um, this is actually very serious. I believe that the lack of action on the side of Europe has forced now the United States to take steps that are destabilized in the Middle East. But why will the US continue supporting Europe? I mean, of course, this is business for their own companies. What's their game? There are many answers to that, and uh, that goes more into the political arena. I, I would not go there. Uh, I will try to stay on the geopolitical part. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Christian, for the bright presentation and took the horizon. But just to sum up, your uh, forecast for the economy in the future is pretty cloudy. So, uh, low growth, deflationary uh, pressure, and conflict. What can we expect from the financial market then? We can expect, I would say, the following. We should stop uh, hitting ourselves with the court. Uh, the financial markets, yes, we've done a lot of mistakes, but the financial markets, as I said at the beginning, are merely reflecting the state of the world. 
the world as I show it, you know, even religion has been shaken, science has been shaken, everything has been shaken. Geopolitically, most importantly, is in motion. So the financial markets are going to continue to reflect that uncertainty and that heightened tension. I would not try to run away from it. It is just a given. You know, the message here for you today is not of a crisis. Uh, we know we are in a time of crisis. It's rather change. The message here today is something, something up to the run up to September 2015 is going to change, most likely in the Middle East and in the Far East. And uh, you better be prepared for that. You know, these big emerging economies are in crisis. Something is changing geopolitically in the Middle East. You know the situation between the US and Russia has changed. That's affecting the Middle East. The fragile balance in the Middle East is finishing now. It's over. We have a northern and a southern alliance built. Israel caught right in the middle. So we know that some change is coming over, coming to us soon, probably before September 2015. That's what I, I would guess. That's what uh, Israeli army, uh, Iranian army are preparing for. They are preparing for a, a sort of confrontation over the next two years. Um, you know, unfortunately, in this part of the world, I mean, I say it unfortunately, unfortunately, it depends how you put it, where you are. But we have to come to terms that in that part of the world, religious beliefs are very important. We can pretend that it's not there, but it is our, our own demise if we don't do that. Uh, and this is the message here for you. Thank you.